I mean, in terms of this project, I definitely watched Henry Fonda in 12 Angry Men. I guess I was interested in reaching towards um, those kind of archetypal American stoic heroes. You know, I watched To Kill a Mockingbird as well, again. Atticus Finch is another kind of characters in a similar vein. Because I think part of the challenge of, of this role, I think, is that he, I felt he couldn't be too, um, not someone who showed everything all the time, that he was trying to hold himself and this country together. Uh, I usually like to start by asking uh, our guests how they got their SAG card, but I know that might be tricky for you because you started and obviously still work in the UK. Do you do you know what your first SAG job was? Um, it was basically this job, weirdly, yeah, because I had not I had not worked in the US before, but then uh, I actually shot um, a film in New York for about a month before I started. Um, the, the, this uh, at Manhunt in, in Savannah. Um, and so it was, yeah, uh, Nicole Holstein's film, You Hurt My Feelings, straight away by this project. But that was my, yeah, that was my introduction to all things SAG, yeah. Oh, wow, because you've been, I guess your whole career has been UK-based. I've made a lot of um, shows for American companies, but they've all been shot in Europe. So, you know, Rome was shot in Italy, um, you know, uh, Game of Thrones was in, in Northern Ireland. Yes, obviously a lot of American stuff is shot over here and in Europe and in the UK. So, yeah, I never actually worked in the States. Well, let me ask you this. what What's your first job as an actor? What do you sort of consider, you know, the, the one where you felt like I can call myself an actor now? Um, it was, we have... Um, like um, um, a hospital drama here in the UK called uh, Casualty. Um, and I, yeah, my first job out of drama school was as a, a sort of a son of one of the doctors in that show. Uh, it gave me a kind of into, because actually, I mean, this is going back a bit, but the acting training then was quite light on screen stuff. You didn't really, I hadn't been taught much about that. So um, yeah, I had these six months uh, working on this um it's kind of, I guess, like a sort of soap in a way. Um, shooting pretty quick. Um, and um, yeah, it taught me, it was, uh, yeah, it was taught me a lot. Yeah. Uh, so that brings you to Apple TV Plus's Manhunt. Um, and I'm so curious because how much did you know about Edward Stanton or, or even the assassination of Abraham Lincoln when this project came your way? I knew so little. Um, and one of the things I hope that um, this, you know, this show does is bring to a wider audience this uh, pretty extraordinary story. And yeah, at the heart of it is this um, very interesting man who, again, I knew very little about, um, but he's clearly, um, you know, a pivotal figure in this in this period of of America's kind of um, formation. Because I spoke to one of your co-stars uh, who plays John Wilkes Booth, and because he's Irish, I believe he he had never really heard of John Wilkes Booth other than a reference on The Simpsons. <laughs> That's cool. You um, probably at least heard of Lincoln, but maybe not Edwin. Yeah, I don't think Edwin didn't make it into um, into The Simpsons. I mean, no. <laughs> So what appealed to you about the role? Because I, you know, I have no excuse. I'm, I grew up in America and I didn't really know his name. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what drew me to the project was A, the story. It's um extraordinary sort of piece of bit of history. Um, and then, yes, at the center of it is this um, pretty complicated uh, man. Um, I, you know, I liked that he wasn't... Um, he wasn't perfect in any way. You know, he's um, a neglectful father and a rather absentee uh, husband. And, but, um, you know, those qualities, the sort of stubbornness and sort of contrariness, uh, I, I think are what um, allow him to, or allowed him to uh, be the right person in the right place, um, you know, in, that, in the immediate kind of maelstrom after Lincoln's, Lincoln's killing. You've 
portrayed real people before. Does it change your approach from playing a fictional character? Do you do you like having material to draw on? I mean, yeah, I really like it. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no no recordings or footage of Edwin Stanton, so uh, I, you know, I have plenty of license. Um, in but it's helpful in that you know it gives you plenty of places to start. Um, both you know, reading about the person, learning about a very different you know political world. Um, you know, put pre-modern, pre-social media, pre-television, you know, it's um, and, and a fledgling country that is being kind of um, formed in a way. Um, and so all those things I find really helpful to uh, sort of trigger one's imagination about um, how to bring that sort of person uh, believably to a screen in some way. Um, and I guess it contrasts with, you know, say like The Crown, there you're kind of overwhelmed with footage and um, audio recording of of the of the other person, you know, um, Philip, uh, and so then that's a sort of different challenge. It becomes a sort of technical challenge to begin with. You've got to get close to how he moved and how he spoke um, before you do anything else. Um, this is different. This is in a way trying to transport an audience through time a bit and give them a sense of a different sort of moral code, a different. Um, set of priorities i guess i'm actually curious when you're when you're playing someone you know like philip that that you know there are recordings out there and people can compare and contrast um how tied are you to that or how much do you just have to sort of look at it as a character um you know there's so much to listen to how do you know what to listen to but also sort of what to ignore yeah i mean it is a, a an act, it's part the part of the job is curation really um, I always felt very strongly that it couldn't just be mimicry. Um, it was a, a balance that had to be struck because I think if it's pure mimicry, I think that's probably quite irritating to watch over kind of 10 hours of television. So it has to be kind of subtle enough that you can um, spend plenty of time with them, but close enough that you get that kind of tickly excitement of oh yeah it does does sound like they it does feel like them um and that helps to sort of take an audience in to the story but yeah i was I always felt like it was a real kind of act of calibration trying to get the right balance between those two things um i mean i just found a couple of pieces of audio that i really liked and i had to listen to them on repeat uh until i almost was sort of dreaming about it um yeah just trying to get it i guess as relaxed as possible so that you're not kind of working the accent, but it becomes in your muscles and then hopefully um, there's a kind of naturalness to it. Um, I guess that's what you're aiming for. And I mean, you didn't have anything of Stanton. There was no drawings or, I don't know, daguerreotypes from back in the day, anything to go no, off? There were daguerreotypes. Um, and I, yeah, I've had some pushback, you know, because um, really? the, the, the images that we have of him, he's very whiskery. He has this ex extraordinary kind of beard and these whiskers. And it's a, it's a very <laughs> unusual kind of silhouette. Uh, and I guess, yeah, we made a, a, um, an artistic choice to simplify that look, I guess. Um, and I suppose the thinking behind that was, you know, it's a complicated story and Stanton in a way has to guide an audience through the chaos of, of that time. And I felt something that was too sort of distracting in a way visually or was going to maybe be, you know, please the, um, the pedants in a way, but I, I, I worried that it would get in the way of, of, of an audience being able to sort of receive the story and sort of, um, more importantly, receive the ideas and the feelings that are um, being relayed, you know. And also, again, like we know Abraham Lincoln has to have a beard in the mole, but we really don't know. I, I, I actually am a little amused that there's somebody out there nitpicking that about uh, the character. There always is, there always, of course. And, and, and fair play, I, I understand it. Um, but it, it has to be a, a balancing between storytelling and sort of um, historical accuracy. Those two things have to live alongside each other, I think, yeah. So where did you even begin with your research? Because I know Manhunt is, is based on this book by James L. Swanson that I hear is just like 
so, so expansive. Was it a good resource? Yeah, that's a great resource. Um, he's, uh, and, and, and James was also came to set occasionally. So that was really helpful, a real uh, font of knowledge. Um, what else did I do? I also watched um, Ken Burns' amazing documentary about the Civil War. Um, you know, the Civil War is a huge, is a, a huge ingredient um, in this story. It's what's just happened and it kind of suffuses everything um, because, you know, so, so many people have been lost. There was so much sort of, um, um, sort of suffering. Um, and I think, I think our story doesn't make sense without, um, you know, that, um, you know, that backdrop. Um, what else did I, the team of rivals, a rather amazing nonfiction book about Lincoln's cabinet. That was really helpful to give us a sense of the kind of political world and how they operated. Um, so yeah, and amazing things like, you know, um, little details like, you know, people would turn up at the White House and be able to get a meeting with Lincoln. That kind of almost unimaginable now sort of domestic quality to the politics. It was very, um, it was about people talking face to face, um, highly interactive. Um, and so I found those sort of ideas helpful to sort of transport me back to something else, I guess. You might have just answered this, but I'm I'm always curious if there's something you learn in your research or preparation that really helps you lock on to the character, even if it doesn't, you know, make it into the show overtly, but something you keep at the back of your mind that that really helps inform this person. I think probably I think one of the biggest ones for me, and this is a slightly more abstract idea, but just the num how many dead and you know in terms of like a, a proportion of the population that who had died and the number of people that lost children and obviously lincoln and stanton both lost children and so i just feel i felt like that was a real touchstone for the sort of bedrock of the story but so that's what it was all in response to that i think um and and then I guess the other thing that I was very surprised when I first started to read into the story was how close to the end of the Civil War the killing of Lincoln was. I had never understood that it was just days after and that actually his killing threw the, the result of that war into question. Um, and so that made it um, so much more kind of, what is the word, kind of dynamic as a story that it was a group of people really fighting for the future of this country uh, in a very, in a very real sense. Um, and so, yeah, that really helped me to kind of make it um, as a median and kind of personal as possible. You mentioned, you know, finding the voices for your characters. Um, I'm curious with, with, with this role in particular, well, first of all, why are Brits so good with American accents when we're not as good at the British accent? Um, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Obviously, because there are yes, there are a lot more Brits playing Americans than it seems the other way. I think it's because your culture is just um, everywhere here. You know, we have so we've all grown up on American cinema. Um, you know, all, most of my favourite sort of films are from like seventies America. Um, obviously, so much American television. So the sound is just with us the sound of your voices are with us. And so I think it's just in our water a bit more than maybe the reverse, you know. Um, and also I, I, a slightly technical answer, I also think the American accent is slightly more relaxed mm. sort of in terms of the musculature, whereas um, the British is, is a lot tighter. And so I think it's just harder <laughs> for your mouths to find the shapes. Maybe we just have to sort of like let it all go. And, it, we, and so maybe that helps. I don't know. Um, no. Uh, yeah. No, I was going to say, like, I grew up on Monty Python and I still can't do a British accent. I sound like a chimney sweep. So um, I, I don't think you can do that alone. I don't know if that's something they actually teach you, like in when you're going to drama school, you know, uh, if, if accent work is something that is is really prolific. Yes, we do. We did do lots of uh, quite a bit of accent work and American was part of that. So 
Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested to know. I want to hear what your uh, Monty Python <laughs> voice is like. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like, call blimey, governor. Um, oh, that's a that's a declaration of war. I'm sorry. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> It, it literally is like all Monty Python characters in my head. So it's very exaggerated. <laughs> um, oh, and you're not just doing, I mean, it's not just an American accent. It's a very specific time and place because this is, you know, the 1800s, obviously. Did, did you have a vocal coach for this? Yeah. Yeah. I worked with someone. Um, I mean, we didn't, again, you know, there's no audio from it. So I guess I more tried to get a voice that felt right for the man. Um, also folding in a little bit the his physical disabilities. He was asthmatic, so I think that sort of feeds into that kind of slightly gravelly quality that we went for. Um, but I'm glad you felt like it had a bit of periodness to it. I was. It's again. That's a sort of. That's a grace note. That's. You don't quite know whether you can, you know, feed that in. Oh my gosh, it, there's there's so much amazing attention paid to every detail. I mean, it feels very I, 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 raw in a way. Um, I let, spoke to some of your co-stars, and it, it sounds like how do I say this nicely? But like things could get kind of filthy on set. Like it was dirty and and muddy and and gross. <laughs> I'm glad you say that. I mean, I, I think we were all keen for to do the kind of story justice and part of that felt like it had to yes have a rawness have an immediacy um and have that quality where you sort of you take an audience back and you know i mean it, with that in mind you know i would definitely want to give a shout, shout out to chloe arbiter who was the production designer um who did an incredible job kind of building the world for us um you know a really yeah, really authored, really authentic, um, very thoroughly researched. It was, um, yeah, it made our job a lot easier every day turning up on those sets. I was going to ask, how much does it help you as an actor to, you know, do all this preparation, but you show up and you, you know, you put on the that outfit and you get into that hair. And does that, that help lock the character and it's sort of its final place? It really does. I mean... You know, sometimes, some days you're, you know, in a bad mood and it helps less, but mainly it's um, it's the kind of very childlike aspect of this job uh, and one that's very privileged in that, you know, large amounts of energy and money have been, you know, expended to give you, give you a, a sort of an environment for you to do the best you can. And so, yeah, um, in that regard... You know, it's uh, I feel very lucky to, you know, to work with someone like Chloe, um, who's, you know, so talented at her job, um, to work with Katie Irish, she did the costumes, all that stuff is, yeah, gives you loads for free. I, I understand it's acting and you're on a set, but some of those, you know, bloody scenes are really grisly. Was it ever hard to shoot those? No, I like all that. I <laughs> sort of... Yeah, I think uh, I'm generally kind of drawn to the the bloodier end of things. I think I like it when it gets sort of dirty and real. Um, it's, that's the sort of storytelling I enjoy watching, and um, it's certainly the, the, the work that I try and make. Uh, I want to touch on this amazing cast because you, you, you often work with really wonderful ensembles and, and ensemble pieces. This is no exception. I, in particular, love your scenes with Hamish Linklater as Lincoln. I love that Stanton calls him Abe. I don't know if anyone else calls him that. Um, I'm sort of curious what he's like as a scene partner. And if you know, I don't know if you knew each other at all before, how that chemistry sort of developed. Um, no, I hadn't met him before. Um He's a really lovely, charming um, human, and, and we're very lucky to have him come in and play uh, Lincoln for us. Um, it's a really important ingredient of the show, I think, that um, the kind of warmth and the sense of friendship at the heart of it, of that story, um, and we don't have that much time to land it. You know, it's, a, it, it's done in flashback, but... Uh, the kind of personal loss that Stanton is going through has to be underpinned by those scenes. And 
Yeah, I mean, Hamish made it very easy. Um, we got along straight away. Um, and he's, you know, he's done a lot of theatre himself. And so there was a kind of natural, which, I, you know, I've done a lot as well, especially in my early career. And so, yeah, we had lots of lots in common. And, um, yeah, we wouldn't talk about it hugely, but we, you know, um, he was a good sort of jazz partner, you know. He was, um, if you threw in the ball, he would catch it. So, yeah, that made it very, very easy to sort of create that relationship. He's done so much theater in L.A. that like and I don't I don't know if you have theaters like this in L.A., but <clears throat> I can remember times seeing him in a show. And then afterwards, he was working the bar for the theater. <laughs> <laughs> we have very small 99 seat theaters out here. So I, I, I love seeing how he's just blown up. That's a gorgeous story. I can imagine <laughs> that uh, he would be, be brilliant at both of them. I imagine, yeah. <laughs> he was actually. Um, we have some audience questions. Um, one is, how would you sum up the journey you experienced with this project thus far? The journey. Um, I mean, it had its challenges. We were shooting in Savannah, Georgia in the summer. It was very hot and humid. Um, and obviously we're wearing quite a lot of wool. Um, so there were some natural kind of physical, um, barriers. Um, I also remember there were the greens department, which is the, they sort of sort out kind of grass and, you know, outdoor stuff. And, um, of course, all the trees in that part of the world have this, all this, um, so ivy stuff growing in the trees. And so they'd have to, you know, if you were shooting in a square, they'd have to go in the sort of days before and sort of strip it all out of the trees. And so there was a lot of, um, a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, the journey was, yeah, I mean, every, I find every job very unique. Um, and this had its own particular kind of texture. Um, and it's made by, you know, the, the people you're working with. Um, I had the good fortune to work with three three really great directors uh, building this show: Carl Franklin, John Dahl, and uh, Eva Sorhag. And yeah, they were invaluable because obviously I'm sort of um, at the centre of it for those five months that we were shooting. Um, and yeah, those are conversations about you know where we're sitting in the story and and we you know when to when to stick or twist. Um, you know, when to show your hand and when not to, that becomes a really uh, important aspect of building a show over sort of seven hours. Um, but I, yeah, I think the journey was mainly learning a lot about a p part of history that I knew nothing about and spending some time in a bit of the world that I had spent nothing, very little time in. They have amazing coastline there. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a happy few, happy few months. And great food. Did you eat many grits? <laughs> I, you know what? I did try it once. I, I'm going to offend lots of people. I wasn't a fan. I'm not a grits man, I guess. Yeah, not you, for me. You've got to get them just right. And I've and uh, this is probably even yeah, more. I maybe I didn't get the right grits, but yeah, I didn't. I didn't go back for seconds. I highly recommend. I hope this isn't offensive. Adding cheese to them. Okay. Yeah. I see. Where were you? I needed you to, to <laughs> about how we eat the grits. <laughs> the grits expert. You needed a grits consultant on, on set. Uh, we have another question. How did you work out Stanton's physical ailments so believably without causing yourself harm? Oh, that's thanks for the compliment. Um, that's great to hear. Um, I guess, yeah, just read a bit as much as I get a sense about the kind of physical realities of asthma, what that sort of feels like, spoke to a few people. And then, yeah, just, um, yeah, I suppose just, in a way the story is about a man um, uh, really um, expending himself physically um so sacrificing himself physically um in defense of a, of a country really it's sort of one of the the themes that are going on and and his 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 frailty his in his breathing is part of that um and so yeah i guess it's both you know technical and specific but also um letting it kind of ebb and flow and be 
part of the kind of story of his descent and the co- uh, and the story of the cost of it, you know, of of what happened. Um, but I'm glad it. Uh, I'm glad it seemed believable. Uh, we have a question I'm actually very interested in, wanting to know your favorite books or films, et cetera, that help you as an actor in character development. I think they mean overall, not just specifically for this role. Um, gosh, I mean, that's a huge question. I, I, I've, you know, watch. But the interesting thing about acting is, you know, acting, amazing acting can happen in lots of different places, it does not just in the big stuff. It can also turn up in, um, in you know, a, a theatre above a pub. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'm a real magpie in terms of being interested in, in other people's work. Um, I mean, in terms of this project, I definitely watched Henry Fonda in 12 Angry Men, um, I guess I was interested in reaching towards um, those kind of archetypal American stoic heroes, um, uh, which in a way, you know, um, is maybe there's quite a, you know, quite a lot of good examples from previous generations. You know, I would include, um, you know, I watched To Kill a Mockingbird as well, again, Atticus Finch is another kind of characters in a similar vein. So yeah, I was watching quite a lot of that kind of stuff um, because I, I, part of the challenge of, of this role, I think is that he, I felt he couldn't be too, um, uh, I suppose not someone who showed everything all the time that he was trying to hold himself and this country together. And so that required a kind of um, a heldness, but you also had to feel um, what he was going through and the suffering. And so, um, yeah, that kind of stoic energy was, um, so I was interested in lots of performances like that. I mean, in terms of other sort of people that I really admire, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman is always a huge uh, hero of mine. Daniel Day-Lewis, um, um, from my own country, Emily Watson, I think is a genius. Yeah, there's um, there's lots of amazing actors that I like to nick stuff from. Oh, when you said uh, Henry Fonda, I assumed you were going to say young Mr. Lincoln. And the, then you said um, 12 Angry Men. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes even more sense. <laughs> I just love that film. I love that performance. It's so, um, cause in a way he's brilliant at someone thinking their way through something. And that's also something that, um, Stanton has to do, you know, we have to sort of watch him work it out and we're working it out with him. Um, and that's a very particular kind of quality. Uh, and I think Henry Fonda is one of the sort of preeminent examples of that. I think. Well, again, it's it's such a fantastic performance and such a great show. I want to remind everyone that it's uh, currently streaming on Apple TV+. And I just want to say on behalf of the sag After Foundation, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your experiences and process and craft with your fellow performers today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks. Give Grits another try. <laughs> hard to find in Kentish Town in London. But... <laughs> Probably. <laughs>